We're thinking this lunchtime about temptation. We're not going to be thinking about the temptations of sex and wealth and power, but a temptation that I think is just as deadly and perhaps even more so, the temptation to follow religious leaders. Now, you may think, well, that sounds a bit odd coming from a a bloke speaking in a religious building, but hear me out. Let me tell you about a friend that I knew when I was at university. This friend had decided to follow Jesus Christ. We just heard Julio read about the time the apostle Peter cried out to Jesus when he was drowning, Lord, save me. And my friend had done the same thing. He'd cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. I and others who knew him were absolutely thrilled. But then a few weeks later, he left the Christian group that we were part of and he joined another religious group. And he told me why. He said he was impressed with the spirituality of the leaders of that other group. He thought they were devout and serious. And they encouraged him to engage in religious activities that were tangible and profound. Now, at the time, I was a bit worried, but I think I probably thought, oh, well, different strokes for different folks. But now, I don't know exactly where he was, but I know that if he was rejecting Jesus Christ to follow the path that was being trod by these other leaders, it was a fatal move. I've seen numerous people over the years make a similar move, and I know myself, I'm subtly prone to that. And I think you are as well. Tell me afterwards if you disagree. But I think we're all prone to follow other leaders other than Jesus Christ. We're partway through our series in Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew has been teaching us what's involved in being part of Jesus' church. Jesus has been revealing how he's building his church. A movement where people who say, Lord, save me, are able to enjoy the world that we long for. A world with no more sin, no more selfishness, no disease, no death. A world where we can enjoy Jesus' care, his provision, his peace, his purpose, now and forever. The world that Jesus came to rescue us for, the world that God created us for. And Matthew's been showing us what's involved in people get into Jesus' kingdom. But Matthew's also been showing us what prevents people from joining that kingdom. So please have a look at our key key verse for today, the big verse that we're homing in on, verse 14. Here Jesus is warning his disciples about leaders, alternative leaders who will prevent people from being part of his people. Jesus says, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So the first question there on the sheet, we've got to ask the question, I guess, what makes these blind guides so tempting in the first place? Have a look again at chapter 15, 1 to 2. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Now, you may be thinking, well, that doesn't sound very tempting. A bit overzealous on on hygiene, perhaps. Or maybe you're thinking, well, I've heard of the Pharisees. I know they're the pantomime villains. I will never be tempted to follow them and follow their kind of leadership. But have another look at these, these couple of verses. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? for they do not wash their hands when they eat. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they are the moral, the spiritual leaders of the nation, seen by many at the time as the good guys, the people who are standing up for the Jewish way of life, teaching the people. And this delegation of them is from Jerusalem, the center of spiritual knowledge. They are the respectable establishment of the day. And their challenge to Jesus does carry weight. And by criticizing Jesus for breaking the tradition of the elders, they're appealing to the moral fiber, the spiritual backbone of the nation. You might remember when 
Rishi Sunak a few months ago was slammed, wasn't he, for leaving late or leaving early from the D-Day celebrations. That's the kind of vibe that these guys are going for when they challenge Jesus. They're saying, look, Jesus, by disrespecting our traditions laid down over the centuries by the elders, you are disrespecting the people who have made this nation what it is. It's like if there's a new manager of the Brazilian football team and people are criticizing that manager for parking the bus, launch, launching the ball long, playing the long ball game. And somebody comes along and says, or lots of people would say, this new brand of football, it desecrates the long-standing traditions, the heritage of this team. And let's not be too quick to mock their concern for hand washing either. God clearly gave commands about washing and cleanliness. It was a visual reminder of the privilege of being set apart as God's holy, special people. The Pharisees, the scribes, they've come up with extra commands to scripture. They've come up with a whole complex procedure for washing properly before eating. Which means on the surface, they look really serious. They look really devout. So can you see the, the temptation that this is presenting to those people listening in? By challenging Jesus, they're saying, there's another way to Jesus. It's a seductive mix, an alluring mix of you get approval from the elite, you get the chance to engage in some kind of virtue signaling, self-justifying external activity that will be impressive. Imagine you were Jesus' disciples listening in. Jesus later warns his disciples to avoid the teaching of the Pharisees. So maybe even they might be wondering, do these guys have a point? We've just been worshiping Jesus out in the wilderness, worshiping him as the son of God. But these guys, with their worship does look pretty impressive when you stop and think about it. They've got the temple, they've got this whole system of, of stuff that they do. And it wouldn't be a bad thing if they approved of us. Jesus has taught us, all we need to do is cry out, Lord, save me. But that's quite, that's quite humbling to admit that we need rescue. Maybe that's a bit too easy. Doing a bit of hand washing, making ourselves look serious and devout, makes us feel good, might make us feel good about ourselves. Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, I get, I get the point a little bit, but may I am not religious. But we need to see this is not just a niche issue for these guys in the first century. If you think about the, the world, millions upon millions of people are following religions that offer approval that, that you can be part of this tradition. They offer that, those activities that give you that self-righteous glow of you're doing something that makes you feel a bit better about yourself. Complete the pilgrimage. You can be truly part of our community. Knock on, a, on some doors. You can really be sure that you're, you're on the in crowd. And it's not just about other religions. We find the same idea within, within Christianity. What, you don't fast during Lent? What, you're not part of the all-night prayer group? If you're keen and you want our approval, you really should be at the lunchtime talk every single week. And it's not just even the leaders of the formal religions who offer this mix of elite approval and virtue signaling. We're all familiar with the implicit, the explicit encouragements from the secular religions to follow the latest cause that, that signifies we are a sound person, we are decent, we are upstanding. You should post on your social media your support for this latest on-trend cause. Ally yourself with the right, the right movement. Wear the lanyard. Fly the flag. Be part of this charitable work. Be part of this city, city club. You'll get the approval of those important people that you look up to, the influential people in your circle. But Matthew's point is whatever path you are tempted to follow other than Jesus Christ... Let them alone, avoid them. They are blind guides. So let's look at our second question. How does Jesus guard us against being taken in? First, he exposes the hypocrisy of these leaders. So have a look at Jesus' answer to the Pharisees and the scribes in, verses, in verse three. Jesus answered the Pharisees and the scribes, and he said, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? 
Jesus counterattacks. He points to an example of the Pharisees and the scribes where they were actually encouraging people to break two of God's good commands about how you should look after your parents. You see it there in verse four. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Here's what the religious leaders were teaching people in verse five. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Can you see how Jesus completely punctures the sham of their man-made religion? The religious leaders had encouraged their followers to ring fence their wealth as a legacy gift to go to the work of the temple, to go to God's work when they died. Now, I don't quite understand the details. You could ask someone at one of the lawyer's tables afterwards, but they had done it in such a way that the leaders and the leaders and those who followed the leaders had this loophole where they could keep using this money that they'd ring fence for the temple, but they could refuse to let, let their parents have any of it. I know you're my parents, but obviously God is more important than you. So I've allocated my money to his service, so I don't need to look after you. It looks virtuous, doesn't it? To begin with, you're giving money to, to the temple, but it's a complete scam. Their tradition has made the word of God void. They've stopped people obeying God, stopped people caring for their parents. And Jesus quotes from Isaiah, written eight centuries before in verse seven. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It's form over substance. It's paying lip service. We hate this kind of hypocritical pretense, and so does God. Now, let me just say, if you're th thinking, I can see what this bloke is doing. He wants us to sign up to his kind of church and avoid other kind of religious movements. Well, the point is, it, that's not the point. The point is, I am as big a hypocrite as anybody. These, these char charges from Jesus expose me. I know that I've not honored my parents like I should. Sometimes I've made that a similar excuse. I'm serving God. I'm really busy doing that. I don't need to, to look after my parents like I should. Or maybe I, sometimes I've even encouraged others. You know, you're serving. Make sure you're doing that rather than encouraging them to fulfill their responsibility to, to those they, are, they, are, they should be looking after. Service is good when it's done from the heart, but when it's being done to be seen to be doing what is right, rather than doing the right thing, it's really ugly. The point is not, it's about us and them. This is, the point is if we're tempted in any way to follow other leaders other than Jesus, it's hypocrisy. You'll, you'll be able to see the hypocrisy. We see it with celebrities, don't we? They, they travel around the world telling people how they're building a wind farm on their yacht, but they, they're flying everywhere to do it. About 20 years ago, I was, I was doing quite an intensive course with a group of friends. And a chap joined who'd been traveling the world, and he'd got into, into Buddhism. And the group of my friends, they were like, oh, this is so cool. We found a real-life Buddhist. It was the time when Buddhism was really a cool thing to be getting into. He's so precious, he's so wise. You know, he's showing us how, how, how good it is to be silent. He's managed to stay silent for a whole six months in the monastery. He's such a kind person. He's lived off orchid petals. He floats on the clouds. But then on the last night of the, of the course, we went out to a, a dodgy club in the middle of Guildford and the poor guy got, got absolutely hammered and then disgraced himself in various ways. And then everyone was on the lookout then for another person to, to follow. The mask had, had dropped. Again, I'm absolutely no better than that. The point is not I'm better than anyone else, we're better than anyone else. But the point is if we're trying to follow any kind of spirituality other than Jesus, whether it's formal religion, secular religion, it's going to let us down. The point is only Jesus is totally consistent. And you see that in this passage, don't you? We've seen his compassion over recent weeks. Now we see his clarity, his courage, speaking up for what is right. The second reason we should not be taken in by these blind guides 
is these leaders completely misdiagnose the human condition. Have a look at verses 10 to 11. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. The Pharisees and the scribes are teaching that you can be defiled by eating food with your hands when they've not been washed properly. But Jesus says, that's not what defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. That's what, that's what matters. Jesus made it clear that what we say, that reveals what's going on in our heart. And that's what, what, how God will judge us. And we all fall down again when we think about that. We've all used our mouths to lie. We've all slandered people. We've all done it. You and I have not telling the truth about Jesus. Our, our mouths reveal a massive internal problem. We'll look more at that next week when William is back with the next passage. But can you see the point? The system the Pharisees had built was built on a lie, a lie that says it's possible to be good, to be righteous through external activity. It's a lie that's still going strong, both in the religious and secular world. Even this week on on Sunday morning, I met some people who who were thinking, if we, if we can have the Lord's Supper once a week, that's what it will take to keep us, keep us right with God. People say, if I get baptized in this way, that's how I'll be right. Or in the secular world, if I run this marathon for this charity, if I help the com- company meet its ECG ch- targets. Can you see how attractive it is? Because we feel good about ourselves. We've done something tangible. We think we're doing well. And then our priest or our vicar or our imam or our mum taps us on the back and says, well done, Wes, you're doing really well. But it doesn't matter how clean our hands are, how much money we've raised through, on just giving, how many badges and awards we have in our email signature. It doesn't make us right on the inside. It doesn't make us right with a holy God. And so it's vital that we're crystal clear where this false leadership takes us. Have a look again at verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Throughout the section, people being offended means they're they're unwilling to accept Jesus as Lord. They're unwilling to, to believe in him. Jesus answered, verse 13, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Now, if I'm blind and I want to navigate the most dangerous mountain path, or I want to walk through a minefield in a war zone, or I want to navigate the pavements of London scattered with electric bikes, the last thing I need is someone to, offering to lead me who's wearing a blindfold. But what is that blindfold? The blindfold comes from not listening to Jesus' diagnosis of the human condition. Jesus tells us that we cannot save ourselves, but if we think that we can, or we listen to those who think that we can, we're being led by blind guides. And if we follow that, we follow what the schools tell us, the government tells us, what the church sometimes tells us, that we are decent people, we're good on the inside, we just need a little bit of help here and there. Well, we're deluded. We don't really think we need the rescue that Jesus came into the world to give. And we're being led into God's judgment unprotected. Last week, William took us to those three words that Peter said to Jesus when he was drowning, Lord, save me. That's the way into Jesus' kingdom, to recognize that Jesus is our Lord, recognize he's the one who rescues us, recognize that we need that personally. But there will be people who will come and say, yeah, you don't really need that, just follow, follow us. You can have a little bit of Jesus, but you don't need to rely on him completely. Look, come with us. We've got the buildings. We've got the cathedrals. The great and the good are involved in what we're doing. Look at our traditions. They go all the way right back to the Great Awakening, back to the Reformation, back to the church, the Desert Fathers. We've got the authenticity. Or they'll say, the CEO's on board. The DNI department are on board. They'll say to us, you know, just wash your hands. Light a few candles. Do this kind of social action. What are you doing just, just believing in Jesus, just telling people to follow, follow him and trust in him? Look at all the impressive stuff that we're doing. That is attractive. 
I don't know about you, that I find that attractive. I want to fit in. I want to be recognized for doing something. I want, I'm conscious of my sin. I want to do something that helps me feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting on top of it. But we mustn't be duped. There's only one leader worth following. There's only one leader who can wash us clean. There's only one leader whose approval we need. We need to keep obeying Jesus Christ. So let's remember those three words from last week. Lord, save me. But there will be these alternatives, these blind guides. So let's remember the three words Jesus gives us this week. Let them alone. Let them alone. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for warning us about the blind guides. Please help us to see through the hypocrisy. Help us to to see the reality, the seriousness of our sin. Help us not to be taken in. Help us to see that Jesus is Lord. Only he can rescue us and that we need his rescue. Please keep us praying. Lord, save me. In Jesus' name. Amen.